Okay, so Mr. Engineer, good morning or good afternoon. Um, you had asked me in a tweet, a tweet a few days ago, you know, what, what is the evidence for my faith? Why do I believe what I believe? And if we are to have a discussion about it, we need to actually break it into two parts. The first part of my faith prior to me becoming a Christian is fairly reasonable and we can converse about it and we can discuss it. I can say, look, prior to my becoming a Christian, I actually became intellectually convinced, intellectually and reasonably convinced that there was more, more likely than not that there was a God. And I base this solely on the evidence of my own life, evidence that is freely available to you. And I can say, look, XYZ here, PDQ here, and this, this is what happened to me, and this is, this is how I see the world. And you can go, well, I disagree. Obviously, you probably will. I disagree because XYZ PDQ, and this is what I think, and yada, yada, yada. Now, we can have a perfectly reasonable intellectual discussion based on strictly on the evidence. The second part of what happened to me in my life, far more important to me personally, far more profoundly important to me personally, was my wife took me to a meeting when I was about 30 years old or so, a Christian meeting, and I believe 100% that God himself, that God himself by the Holy Spirit revealed to me that he was who he said he was, that Jesus Christ made himself real to me, that he was who he said he was, that he was God in the flesh, and that God himself revealed that to me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I recognize that that is not a reasonable assertion. That is something that I received by faith, and I received it supernaturally. Can we even discuss it? I don't know. It's not a reasonable point of view. Christianity is not the most plausible of world religions. Right from the jump, it is asking you to believe the clearly not so. Not just believe, you know, that's a stretch. Believe the clearly not doable. Believe what is clearly not possible. This man was born of a virgin. He, he rose from the dead. Those are extraordinary claims. Now, we go back to the same common atheist trope. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary truth proof. In those particular claims, yes. Okay? That is why I'm not necessarily sure we can discuss it. God would either have, you would either have to 100% believe me because I am so personally convincing, or God would have to reveal it to you too. It's not something we can have a rational conversation about. It is not necessarily plausible. It was revealed to me supernaturally. And I 100% believe that. If you put a gun to my head and said, are you lying? I pull the trigger if you lie, I say, I am telling the truth. I 100% believe that that was God, that was the actual living God. And it totally transformed and changed my life from that moment forward. But, like I said, that's not reasonable. And I, I don't expect you to necessarily believe that. What we can do is discuss the first part, where, as an agnostic, a sort of God-leaning agnostic, I came to the perfectly reasonable and perfectly rational co conclusion that God is more probably real than not real, based on the evidence. So what is that evidence? Well, let's start with Exhibit A. Any town USA, doesn't matter where you live and who you are, I would estimate that at least 30% of the people you know in some way or another believe in God. Now. That's a low estimate. It could be as high as 50%. It could be as high as 65%. These are not kooks. These are not young earth creationists. These are perfectly reasonable, rational human beings. And they believe in a God to one degree or another. Now, if you were to ask them why, now, if, if this isn't true in your case, you're unusual. But if it's not true in your case, go to any, any old store, Starbucks, any town USA. 30% of the people right in front of your face are going to believe in God to one degree or another. If you ask them why, you will get some variations on this story. Because this is what happened to me prior to me becoming a Christian. Okay? This was evidence for the existence of God prior to me becoming a Christian. I was about to go actually buy drugs. 
in Harlem. I was about to walk into an abandoned building. Something stops me. Something outside, inside of me, but not me, goes, don't go in there. Don't do it. Don't go in there. I stopped. And I didn't do it. I didn't, didn't walk in. Now that experience has happened to me many, many, many times prior to me becoming a Christian. In Christianity, they call it the still small voice. And that experience is not unique to me. It's happened to hundreds. It's happened to most people. It has probably happened to you, the atheist. If you look at your own life, you probably had that experience three or four times, you know, in your past. You wrote it off. You said, you know, if you asked the people in the Starbucks, they'd say they had that experience. Most people have had that experience. And most people, to one degree or another, recognize that that experience was probably God. They don't really investigate it too closely because they don't necessarily want to know that it was God. But that's why most people would believe right there. They've had that experience where something outside of themselves, something not them, guided them mysteriously, warned them mysteriously. In Christianity, we call it the still small voice. Every other religious tradition in, in the history of the world has some variation on that. Or most traditions have some variation on that. See, the common atheist trope, okay, there's a common atheist thing. They can all be true, but they can all, they can all be right, but they can all be wrong. Is, is completely nonsensical. Prior to me becoming a Christian, I investigated all the other faiths and found that they actually had a lot of thematic similarities. There were a lot of things that they all agreed upon, that they all dealt with things that were surprisingly similar from faith to faith, no matter which one you were talking about. That is why I came to the conclusion intellectually, rationally, before I was a Christian, that there is probably a God. There's a famous phrase by William Blake, all religions are one. There's a reason why that phrase has been so resonant throughout the centuries, because that started to speak to me when I was investigating religions. I was like, God, there's a lot of, there's a lot of similarities here. They all seem to be talking about the same thing. So they can all be right. Now, once you get nailed down to the specifics, obviously there are differences. But even if you take something like, you know, Greek mythology, Greek mythology was not nonsensical stories made up for no particularly good reason. In Greek mythology, they were trying to grapple with things, hidden realities of the world they live in, hidden psychological and metaphysical realities of the world that they lived in. That's what the stories were intended to convey. They were intended to demonstrate things, come to terms with hidden things that, that they were trying to, to work out in their stories. They weren't just nonsensical tales spouted for no particularly good reason. So when you say stuff like, you know, you don't believe in Zeus, well, when you start investigating Greek mythology, some of the stuff they were working out, yeah, I, I found true. I was like, okay, that's really interesting. That's very similar to this concept in Buddhism. And then when I was reading Buddhism, I was like, wow, that's very similar to the concept here in Islam. There are thematic there are constant thematic themes running through all of them that are surprisingly similar and surprisingly resonant from faith to faith. So the whoever told you that they can't all be true is a liar because they all deal with things that if you investigate with your eyes open, you're like, oh my gosh, there probably is a God, reasonably, rationally. Just take Tao Te Ching, one of the things I was most into.